Costas. Um, the, you know, Costas explained why Latin America, what he didn't explain or didn't tell you, because he doesn't know, is that there is a, uh, we have here what, three uh, present and past Alta That's heads. true, yes, that's true. And, yes. But the, Amazing, the yeah. The reason that you have three Alta heads here is there's a secret conspiracy. You take okay. over Hermes from Latin America. Okay, yeah, I should war. learn war. this. Okay. Exactly. War, no? so we're, we're, we're infiltrating, we're infiltrating, we're infiltrating <laughs> the Hermes uh, organization. And you have so. the next. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, for those of you who don't know Latin America, obviously it's a smaller region, about 6% of the uh, world traffic. And in similar to other parts of the world through the crisis, a couple of different very little government uh, support, if any, I don't think there is any government support in, in the region that I know of. It's a region that's very fragmented, just like Africa, a uh, developing area, just like Africa, and, but a, a region which always has a lot of potential. So we have great, three great uh, panelists. Uh, I start with uh, Jose Ricardo Botello, who is the executive director of and CEO of a little organization called ALTA, uh, the, Air, uh, the Latin American and Caribbean Air Transport Association. Uh, we've got uh, Nico Sofaris, who is the Managing Director of Golder Airline Services. And last but not least, we've got uh, Jeff Pitt, who is the Managing Director uh, of uh, Oval. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, Luis Felipe, who I guess was afraid about my questions and has disappeared <laughs> temporarily, but we'll, we'll, we'll involve them also. And we have obviously in the, in the audience some uh, experts in the region as well. So, um, one of the things you probably don't know is that two of the three panelists start, started their positions during the crisis. So it's either they're kamikazes or, uh, or masochistic or, uh, or, or both. Uh, so I'm gonna, ask, uh, I'm gonna ask both to tell us a little bit of their experience being thrown into, into the fire in, in the middle of the crisis. So anything you would like to tell your predecessor in terms of when he offered you the job or suggested that you take the job and what you got that you might want to thank you for, Thank you, former president. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Yes, I'd like to say something, but I can't say something, you know, because actually we took the, the position in the beginning of the, this Christ. But before, I would like to thank you, Costa, again for the invitation, and thank you, uh, Hermes, Etienne, and Al as well, because it's always a great pleasure to be here with you and see that you always open your house, put your family together. So thank you very much. But I'd like also to thank you, Yona. It's a great pleasure to be here. And after 24 hours flying, when we land, I see Teta smile in front of me. It's um, it's amazing. It's, it's very nice, thank you very much. This is very rechargeable, thank you very much. Well, actually, uh, Alex, when, when I took the position, uh, I, I don't know actually if I was invited by friends or enemies, you know, because I was I was the former director of the Civil Aviation Authority in Brazil, and I saw the numbers like that. When I left the, the mandate and they took this position, I saw the numbers like that, so it was really terrible. But what happened in our region, and I, I saw back same year, it's the same that happened in many other parts in the world. Uh, it's, it's all, everything that happened there without the, 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 the aid of the financial aid of the government we, in our region, we didn't have. Uh, but it's all about actually trust is if you believe or if you not believe in this sector. Because if you believe what happened we went there with the authorities for the cards. We have done everything. It was like the the knights in the in the rebel table. We took that document to our countries as in Africa. But what happened? It happens when you don't believe. The decision which for the uh, people of um, health uh, authorities. So this was very complicated in our in our region. But right now, what we see is that we went from one extreme to another. And they, now that we see the lights, we see the vaccination right now. I believe that it's comfortable to say that okay, the vaccination is there, but we cannot wait for 100 
100% of vaccination. We have to deal with this as an industry, and this is what we have been trying to do. We still have some counters that are closed, but most part of that, uh, they are opening with some restrictions. But we see like Brazil and Mexico, and if you talk about Brazil, I talk with a market with more than 200 million people. Talk about Mexico, it's 145 million people. If you add the US, it's more 330 million people. It's a huge market. So we believe that in our region, when you get the, the total, I saw, I think, what Donald was saying that in Europe we are going to come back to 19 in 2023. Yes, about that. In our region, it's the same. I saw the studies of the, um, ICF, made by ICF. But in some countries, like Brazil, Mexico, you are going to see this in the beginning of this year. So in the beginning of this year, they are 100%. And they are ready to take off more than in 2019. So, of course, depending on the measures that was made by the, the, the authorities, we have been working from an auto, we have been working with the authorities, trying to say, hey, quarantine is not the answer because you have the protocols. But it, this is it. Was was a tough time, but we, we see the light. If we you have to that. choose one country in Latin America, you say, look, we should be doing more like this country. Which do you uh, think is the best? Mexico. 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 Mexico, because what happened, if you go to Brazil, Brazil, uh, they kept the space uh, open, but they had some restrictions from uh, people from outside, and also they suffered from uh, other countries. But if you go to Mexico, it was 100% open, measures was taken, and we see what happened. The people was flying with uh, the measures that in, in, in this is very important to say that measures was not made by the industry, was made with the industry together. Because actually, IKEA call us. And when you talk about IKEA, we are talking about the government. I mean, they have specialists there to solve the problems in civil aviation. They call the industry. So, so the we went really together. together. So this was to po was supposed to be, you know, the, the the base of everything. But actually, bad side cities, unfortunately, haven't worked. When you take this, when you took this for one country, they can say, yeah, I understand this. I see the the, the layers, but I, I want some point. And, and we'll get a little bit more uh, to that point before we spoke about the importance of working together. Uh, Jeff, you started uh, Ally in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, tell me what, uh, what, how has that been? And more importantly, uh, you oversee, you look at the whole industry. Uh, what has impressed you the most? And what, uh, what's been, uh, uh, what's been the negative side of what you've seen? as a symptom of the pandemic. <laughs> it sort of manifested because in the, in the, at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, was my second life in aviation. The first one I came to one of the first mergers. And you know that very well because you were part of that too, La Chile and La Deco. The, the Chilean Airlines, when they merged and everybody, they were throwing eggs at, at you know, and La Chile were taking over this magnificent little airline and, and so it, it, it is not the first time I go through hard times in aviation but uh, the thing that has impressed me the most is the ability of the industry now to be as one. Uh, airports, airlines and I just came back to Athens from the CCMA and MRO conference that Alta for the second consecutive year uh, had the courage to organize a massive conference, uh, 500, 600 people, uh, with no risks and everything very well taken care of. And uh, and you see there that the industry, I, I think it was the right decision to carry out this this conference because you see the industry, the industry as one. Well. You don't only see airports and airlines. I heard you at a previous event that you know, one of the great things is that you see those two ends together, but now you see even the suppliers and everybody willing to, you know, take, um, to make efforts to continue to be part of, the, of this industry. So I think that's, that's the most amazing thing. Um, 
any disappointments then they said damn they should be they can do better i i think that that's where i would put it they can do better uh, and, and being a relegation specialist and having worked in aviation from that end i think if there's one thing here is that the industry has had a lot of messaging a lot of interlocutors governments you know, regulators so many different and, and new people like like you know you suddenly you got the ministry of health inside the airport right uh i, I don't think it's it's casual or it's it's just a um, fruit of, of something completely out of the blue that the current i mean that the minister of tourism in greece has just been appointed is the former minister of health because you know suddenly these two sectors these two areas of the economy are so much intertwined. So I, I would say um, it's the messaging. It's, it's I think, uh, we've discussed this with, with uh, uh, Jose Ricardo many times, I think I've talked to Luis Felipe as well, that, you know, the industry should agree on common messaging. And I think ICAO has the role to play that because the more you repeat yourself in, in a time of crisis, crisis has a very, very huge element of communications. And in what sense? You repeat and you agree on a message and you basically, there's a point when the wall will come down. But when you have different people sort of picking up, you know, terry picking or messaging or communications, oh, and being so reactive, I think there's, a, there's work to do there. We should agree on, 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 you know, more common messages. And I think the ground is there because airlines and airports are, you know, sort of working together in that respect. And you, now I see all the, supply chain even I mean they're all suffering and, and, and they're, they're, there is common ground I think more of that I would say they haven't done the right thing I think there's a lot to be you know to be glad as, as for Allah um, well I think we, we started with Costas and, uh, and it has been a fantastic trip the best trip I've taken over the last 12 months, and, and I've been in a lot of places. We believe it was saying that I've traveled more than he does. <laughs> but uh, the great <laughs> thing about it is that everybody was on the ground, like you're here. So everybody was reading, everybody was wanting information, wanting to get their voice out. So it was great. And much to my regret, because I'm a great admirer of you know, like airline magazines, you don't have a lot of now places where you can communicate. So having put together a website uh, in English and Spanish that covers the whole aspects of the industry, not just airlines going there, you know, stopping going there, but everybody, everybody has a voice. I think it has been, it, it, it was the right time. Everybody was eager. Congratulations to you and, uh, and to Costas. I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about the traffic, but if we as industry leaders, part of the industry, we don't start flying, how can we expect our passengers to start flying, yeah. to go to events and do things? So it's, it's uh, sometimes you have to, uh, to, to, how do you say, the plane dance or dance? It's a, uh, yeah, it's something. Walk the talk. Walk the talk. Walk the talk. Yeah, it's something about this. Uh, last year, when we, we said, hey, we're going to do this CMA in our own, that was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to be, was the, we did it in, in Cancun. Yeah. A lot of people called us and say, hey, this is going to be the only one in Latin America. Yes. You have to cancel that. You know yes. that very well. Oh, yeah. We, we, we spoke yeah, we a lot. We we'll have to cancel that. And we said, look, every day as an industry, we go to the government to say, hey, you have to keep this guy open. We know the protocols. We worked with the, the IKO yes. about the protocols. Yeah. We are going to do the protocols in the event. Why am I going to cancel? Again, it's about believing. If I don't believe what I'm doing, who is going to fight? Yeah. So, we did it, and we was you, you were there. It was a tremendous work, but we tested everyone 100% on no. Yep, everything was safe. And this year, everything was safe. Again. So this is a this is the message that we'd like to, to send to everybody. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Nico, let me bring you into, into the conversation. You uh, you represent a different side of the business. Uh, you're the ground handling. You're the cargo. You're the GSA. Um, and you're from outside the region. What, why, why Latin America? What's attracting you about uh, Latin America? 
haven't heard what you've heard now from your two colleagues and you're still interested <laughs> <laughs> in the region or not. Even more. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to, to correct you and uh, tell you that we also have started during the crisis. Oh, so we started we actually week. one week before the first lockdown. Oh, okay. okay. So this is the ICU. Yeah. 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 So this is, is the, the new country. <laughs> so uh, I had uh, this uh, near-death experience, like everybody here in this beautiful garden, uh, that nobody knows if we will exist on the next day, if our businesses will still exist. We really um, calculated uh, on, on a weekly or on a monthly basis how many months we will sustain this situation that we faced in the, in the first period. So we said, okay, we have this amount of money, divided oh, by, yeah. by our costs to see how much we will survive if this situation continues. So it was a near-death experience, uh, in a way. Of course, we are healthy, and this is the most important. Uh, on, the, on the other, the other hand, uh, uh, I, I heard some, some things from, from the previous discussions that covered a lot of the things that I would like to, to add here. But uh, uh, still, I just, before I answer your question, I would just like to, to answer to, to Michael uh, who, who said something very interesting. That in the beginning, he was afraid that more airlines would default. Uh, that was my, exactly my impression as well and my fear, because th this is a fear. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's your airline or the competitor. It is a fear for the industry, it is a fear for our jobs. Michael, I'm not sure that we are over this yet. Because uh, you are right that up to now it had little effect. But let's see until the end if we are still all yes. alive. And, uh, and uh, I think it's delayed. I think it's delayed actually in the US. You had Chapter 11, for example, and Latin American carriers. Latin American. A lot of carriers took advantage of Chapter 11 protection uh -huh. to reorganize, and that's good in a way as long as we do it. But I'm, I'm with both of you that. I don't think we've seen the end. I think consolidation, you know, if you look at, at, at aviation as a global industry, it's probably one of the few global industries that you have so many players and that are not consolidated. And in most global industries, you have maybe three, four, five players that have 70% 70, 70 of the market. If you look at aviation, the biggest is about what, 10%, 12%, something like that. So there's still a lot of, a lot of, a lot of room for consolidation. But, but, but a, a default here, a, 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 a serious default will be massive, have a massive effect because it is not easy for other regional airlines to take over the routes and the market uh, at all times, at, at all regions at least. And this may cause long-term effects. Uh, so this is something that is, is still around. We, we have to, to, to wait and see what will happen. And I'm also not sure if uh, as the colleagues in the, in the previous panel said, if we are uh, close to the end of this thing, we are always facing new mutants of the of the of the COVID, exactly. and we're not sure if, if the vaccines will be uh, good enough. And uh, uh, here in Greece now we have 97% of the Delta uh, mutant, 97% of the infection. So who knows if we will uh, be okay with the next mutant? And it, it is something that we are all hope. That next summer, uh, as the colleagues from Aya and, and Gian said, we hope that next summer will be a good summer, a be even better than this year and close to 2019 figures. But we have to, to be a bit conservative uh, because we, we cannot know for sure what will happen. It, it, it is a lot bigger than we all expected. So, to, to your question, I'm sorry about this. Um, Latin America, uh, of course, I'm the outsider of, of this uh, panel here. Um, Latin America is a very large, large region and a very large part of the world. And, uh, although it is six percent, uh, let's say, of the, of the, of the world traffic right now, uh, for us being a Greek uh, GSA company, actually what we do is we represent airlines in the, in the Greek territory. Uh, it, it is a very large and, and has very large potentials as a market. Why is that? As a GSA, we represent companies like like ours represent uh, online and offline airlines. Uh, for the online part, there is no 
from specific interest. Uh, as at the moment, there is no flight from Latin America to Greece, or uh, uh, not even a seasonal flight. However, this may change in the future. Uh, but as an offline market, uh, we, we believe, we know, that we would like to, to, to show this potential to the Latin American carriers as well, that there is a great potential for them here in Greece. Why is that? Uh, Greece, uh, for, 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 for all of your information, uh, the nowadays, and I'm not talking about uh, September, I'm talking about the average of 2021 and 2022, the 95% approximately of BSP sales, of, of all the tickets sold from Greek territory, were uh, marine, marine traffic, meaning they have nothing to do with Greek origin. Of, of, the, of, the, of the passengers. This, this is happening due to a very specific uh, factor. The 21.3 percent of international shipping is owned by Greek shipping companies. These shipping companies are headquartered here in Athens, and they are booking the transportation, the repatriation of all sea crew members of all their 5,000 vessels, which is a global. Area has nothing to do with Greece. I'm talking about commercial fleet. I'm talking about tankers, I'm talking about uh, of, uh, container ships, I'm talking about bulk carriers, uh, I'm talking about LNG carriers. So Greece is the leader in this market in the shipping industry. We hold 58% of the European market and 21.3% of the global market. Okay. So how much of the Latin, Latin American market? The, 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 there is no answer to that because the global fleet, this is a global market, and all of these vessels move all around the world. Every every month, every day, there's a new contract saying, okay, now you go to, 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 to this port. So these, these vessels change their, their, their crew members at any given day. Every actual day, crew changes are taking place. So this 95%, and under normal circumstances, a 45% of all sales are of this market. <laughs> now, uh, in, the, in the previous panel, they talked about the changes in the market. And I think it, uh, I'd like to expand a little bit. I had it also as, as an area that I'd like to hear a little bit more about you. The marketplace is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, the business, how people do business is changing. Mm -hmm. And business traffic is the main one of the main revenue generators mm -hmm. for the airlines. As that market will recover, the question is how much will it recover? How many people will just do Zooms from now mm -hmm. versus before? And that is, that's that's a reality of the play. How do you think that's gonna affect your airlines and your market? Yeah, the market has changed a lot. We have, we have changed a lot, yeah? That's why uh, we, ha we have to keep in mind something. If this crisis had happened 20 years ago, without the internet, without the 4G, 5G, this would be like 1929 again. It would be like a boom in, in, in the world. But thanks God we had the internet, we have the technology, so the technology is there. Yeah. But, and we could work in this meanwhile to, to survive, if, 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 if I say. But you have to keep in mind that it, this is the first time in history that we have five generations working together or living together. We have the Belle Epoque people, we have the boomers after war, we have the X, the Y, and we have the Z people. So the market has to, and that's why it's so, so difficult to send a message, one message, even together, that's why it's so, so difficult because one like to read, the other like to print, to read, the other one like to receive this in audio, so it's, it's completely different. So. We, we truly believe that right now, with the technology that we have, we are going to have people in some industry that are going to keep this for um, this model as a, um, to, save, to save money, as a uh, cost saving. But I truly believe that in our business, in, in this industry, this contact is essential. I mean, it will continue, but for example, the, the traditional network carriers that you have in the region, the Latams, the Aeromexico, mm -hmm. uh, Avianca, okay. how are, uh, 
what what do you think is their future compared to the low cost or ultra low cost? Because they they a lot run. of their money mm -hmm. comes from the business yes. and their network is based on the business traffic. That's going to change. If if you have the if you have the right regulations and you have the the mentality of LCC, you can bring this for a legacy. You just have to change the legacy. And I truly believe that what we see right now with this this industry is that if I, if you don't change, you are going to be extinct. This happened with the dinosaurs. So you have to, and I believe that the industry have done this in Latin America and Caribbean. They are doing something. We are going to have some uh, some how to say uh, that we, they are like together. Okay, uh, some consolidation are going to have that, but this is. This is one part of the situation we're going to, uh, because I believe that the authorities that deal with market they have to take care of them to keep the competitiveness in each country. This is very important. But as you, you give some example, we have three of the largest one in, in Latin America and Caribbean. They went to Chapter 11. What, what does it mean? It means that they, I want to change, I have to change, and I need the support to change. Because if you go to US or you come here to Europe, you have the support of the government with uh, financial aid. I mean, but they have no. So what is the best way to keep you operating and to serve the marketing and stay in the market? Okay, let's go to chapter 11. Let's renew this industry. Let's renew the company and be here. If you have to put your money right now and invest in shares of a company, which, which, I guess if which I one are you <laughs> Local, I won't tell you, you don't I have to say, say the name, just, just the time, network or low cost? If I say that tomorrow, my board is going to fire me. No, I cannot say that to my former president. <laughs> but I have, I have my, my coins. We'll, we'll talk about over a drink okay, after. Perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned you've been traveling a lot. Do you feel, you see difference in the type of traffic of the passengers when you're flying? Uh, or uh, is... It's, a, it's absolutely a different reality. What he said about Mexico, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, you get to Mexico and say, where is it? I mean, a guy approached me in, in Cancun last year. This is, this is I'm going to be very, very sort of trust you all. And he said, don't wear a mask. People who are cocaine addicts wear masks. You know, they, can, they can hide their, you know, their nose. And I said, what? Because nobody was wearing a mask. And it was just ridiculous. And then in the airports were full. People were trying to get people out of, of the airports. It was full of taxis. It was like amazing. Uh, I would say that uh, you see great examples of the way they have, they, they're managing. And I'm impressed in Latin America. I mean, you know, um, uh, Eurowide, for instance, it's a small country. I mean, yes, half of the country lives in the capital city. I mean, they have the most beautiful airport for it. Carrasco is if, if anyone wants to see a beautiful construction, that's it in South America. But I mean, the technology they have applied. And this is a region with 6% of the traffic, the world traffic. And then in the end, you say, well, how have they done it? And, and they, have, they have really invested. I, I was just in the Dominican Republic, same thing. Amazing. I mean, it's an airport that, yes, it's beautiful. It has this beautiful sort of. The First Nations, yes, yeah. yeah. It's an airport it's without walls. Yeah. I mean, you're there, and you know, and, and it, 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 it's. But they do have the machines, and they they are caring in a way that they can handle the most. I mean, the greatest amount of people they can handle. Um, but um, well, you, you you mentioned a good point there, which is the technology, and I think it's been mentioned before that this crisis is helping speed up a little bit the limitation and the acceptance of some of this technology. Uh, is there anything or can we do more, especially in the region, as, as you mentioned, in terms of... Uh, I think little by little, it depends on, you know, it, it happens, your way might, might, which was one, I think it was the first country to do it like, like person-less, like the immigration right. procedure yeah. and all that, mm -hmm. and your way was not open yeah. at that time. So, but all the others where you see this, it's it's mostly because they have opened and they have reached out to the technology so that they can, you know, sort of manage this new flows almost, right? Yeah. Um, 
So that's one thing. But going back to the messaging, he is, he's right. Uh, we miss the millennials. Okay, so that's yes. a group. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But uh, when I say about the communications, you know, we're so concentrated in trying to get back, you know, the numbers, in trying to put as many planes in the sky as we can and all that. When I say communications, <coughs> uh, there, there is one key aspect that I think aviation should feel proud and everybody should go out of this meeting and of any conference feeling proud about the sector and that is sustainability. There's not a single airline, at least the region that I cover, like the Americas, and I include the US and Canada as part of it, there's not a single company that has dropped its sustainability goals. And I was in mining for 11 years. The only reason why governments would allow mining companies to operate is if they had corporate social responsibility and sustainability and environmental management, sound environmental management, right? So in this case, all you see is that all the goals are there. There are companies that are saying that they're going to do it ahead. Embraer just announced 2040, not 2050. And where's that message? The industry is coping with that, no matter facing the greatest financial you know, burden that has ever faced. And then the other thing, I've been reading a lot about this. Um, I'm an immigrant myself. And three generations back, my family were all immigrants from one place to another. One of the things that, for instance, has, yeah, everybody's gonna say, well, they left the mess there, of course they have to do this. The craft operation, the, the, you know, the, the Civil Reserve Aircraft Fleet, mm -hmm. American, United, Delta, Alaska Airlines, mm -hmm. putting planes to bring all those refugees out of Afghanistan. Where's that message? Where's the message that aviation is a fundamental part of human rights in this world? It's like, you know, they're getting, if he, if, I mean, the U.S. just enlarged the network of airports where they're receiving these special flights. You see the stories about flight attendants and pilots who were refugees themselves, you know, bringing all these refugees out of Afghanistan. And, 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 and there's so many points that we forget or we don't think about because it's either we had to do it, we committed, and I think it's a great uh, asset of aviation. Once aviation commits to something, it usually goes for it and complies with it, sustainability yeah. and all that. But then, you know, that should be highlighted. Sorry uh, to interrupt you, but my boss over there is giving me signals that, that we need we need to, to back. But actually, I think you make a very good point. And not only that, I think we should use more your, your passion and your drive well. and your communication in terms of this. So thank you very much. And just one final quote, uh, since we were doing some quotes before. I uh, don't remember, I think it was Henry Ford that said, when everything seems to be going against you, remember, airplanes take off against the wind, not with it. So, um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you, Jose Ricardo. It was uh, a pleasure having you on. Thank you.